Thank you. Good morning. First of all, let me thank uh, Elise and Federica and Samuel and Samuel for uh, putting all this together and making it a very nice conference so far. Um, yeah, good morning. Thank you for coming. So I haven't really prepared a text that I'm going to write, but um, just some notes and uh, I will have a brief um, introduction to what I want to talk about and maybe then we have more time for discussion. So as Samuel has already said, um, cryptology is... Uh, not only something that predates the digital, because nowadays we think about encryption just in, in terms of uh, email, and for lots of people it's only become a matter of concern uh, after the revelations of Edward Snowden, but it's, um, it's the conditio sine qua non, it's the media technological a priori and the epistemological condition of possibility for the technology that um, pervades all of our uh, lives today. So, and yesterday uh, in the Twitter feed, um, of post-digital cultures, also someone said that we should talk a little bit more about the means of production, the systems and infrastructures of la labor, and the question of technolo technological literacy. So I would try to address that too. But first of all, let me step back a couple thousand years and start um, with the very basic concept of writing. So we have to make clear to ourselves, I think, that with the very advent of alphabets and writing systems, we already have a concept of media. Um, if we define media as something that N and decodes and stores and transmits information. Um, if we go a little bit more deeper into this world of symbolisms, um, we can see how symbols over the course of history start to become operative in a different way. They, they not only um, depict language and uh, create a phonetic system, but we also have non-phonetic writing systems like in China, but they become uh, something that is uh, actually able to produce knowledge in a different kind of way in terms of mathematics. Um, and with the very um, idea of writing also the idea of cryptology uh, co-emerges at the same time. So writing systems have a very inherent quality of volatility, movability, and substituting one symbol with the other one. This is basically what they do. So this is the first encryption tool from the 7th century before Common Era. It's called the Skytale. And uh, as you can see, how it works is basically you have a ribbon of leather on which you write the message that you want to encode and you wrap it around a little stick. And um, the person who you sent this message to has a stick exactly the same size and girth. Um, so you wrap it back around, you have the message. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, the next encryption system um, results in sentences like this. Can anyone read it? This is the so-called Caesar cipher. It's called monoalphabetic substitution. And basically, it was invented and used very much by, by Julius Caesar himself. And what it does is, can, can you read it now? Can anyone tell me how it works? This is the first sentence from De Bello Gallico. Exactly. So basically all it does is step three letters down the alphabet and substitute it and it wraps around at the end. Um, this is also the reason why we have things like Hell 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was actually Kubrick's way of critiquing a company called IBM. It's just one letter down. So. In the 15th century, something uh, happens that is, I think, also another precondition for our digital condition today, that is the letters, symbols, and become actual objects that can be permutated, and what is most important, with the first print shops of Gutenberg, and with the first printers, uh, the printers produced not only books, but for the first time statistical data about language itself. In certain language families, you need more than this, than of that, say, triple the amount of E's than the amount of X's. In, this, in the very same century, around 1460, um, the Baroque scientist Leon Battista Alberti wrote the first uh, Occidental book on cryptology. It's called De Cifris. Um, Brunelleschi was a true Renaissance member. He was also, the presentation is quite awesome, isn't it? Um, 
He was also the guy who invented linear perspective. Uh, he was a student of Brunelleschi. And uh, with that, he sort of wed Euclidean geometry and spatial concepts with art to create linear perspective and uh, the constructible image space. So from that onwards, there was a, diff a different concept of artist that was also sort of already a media engineer came into being. So, but we've seen the Alberti disc, and as you can see, it also is a little tool that works in the way that you can create a simple substitution cipher like the Caesar cipher. But um, what he did is he created another concept called polyalphabetic substitution, where you basically, um, after every uh, step of encrypting, change the crypto alphabet again. So say for the first letter you jump three, three letters, for the second one seven letters back, and you change it all the time. And this is basically how cryptography today still works. So you change the crypto system every, with every letter, which makes it incredibly hard to break. Um, it just takes well, a couple of thousand years actually to break um, a sufficiently long text. Um, there's a fr French guy actually in the same century who helped him um, develop the system. Uh, his name is Visionaire, and he says um, code breaking actually is an inestimable rompement du cerveau, which I kind of like. So around 1500, um, uh, 1591, alphabets uh, and media technologies and mathematics sort of all come together at the same time. So this is the time that we you have to think about that both mathematics and cryptology are still perceived as an, as an art and uh, as a very dark and occult art, similar, like a Kabbalistic practice. And this is something that uh, persistently, I think, still exists today, this kind of view, which is the reason why none of us um, try to really engage with cryptology or mathematics that much. So uh, in 1591, Francois Viette, the French lawyer and the duty of uh, uh, Henry III and IV, um, he does Just, I'm sorry. closer, okay. Um, mostly does uh, divorce law in the, in the um, French royalty system, but is also a self-taught mathematician, um, starts to dabble in cryptoanalysis and uh, to decode the letters of the Spanish League in the French-Spanish War. Um, he comes up with a system of crypto analysis of code breaking that is so good and it works by frequency an analysis which is basically also just counting the letters, see how often certain letters occur in a certain text and then um, making certain deductions from that. Comes up with a system that is so good that he says uh, there's no, no code that I cannot break and he does uh, basically what no crypto analyst would ever do, he publishes he lets the other party know that he can read the code, because, and which of course um, results in them changing it again. But he's so good that Philip uh, II of Spain is actually so angry and lodges uh, a complaint with the Pope and says that black magic is employed against him. Um, the Pope really doesn't care because he also has uh, a whole office of crypto analysts reading the same thing. So while using this code numeric machete of a method to bushwhack through the sprawling jungle of letters, language and meaning, François Viette starts to develop another mathematical tool which would come to instill fear and loathing in the humanity until today, which is the very sentence you can read here. It's the, birth, the nativity scene of symbolic algebra. This is the book, um, the uh, introduction into the analytic art. And this is what it means for us. So basically, with Viet's first rules for what we can call an operative symbolism, which I spoke about before, the actual insignia of modern science are born. And the magic formula disappears and gives way to the mathematical formula. It's important to make clear to yourself that mathematics didn't always look and work the way we learned it in school. Before Viet, mathematics was largely an art or craft used by engineers and merchants, a, collections of a collection of solutions for special problems, mostly rhetorical or diagrammatical, but not formalized and generalized in the form of laws. 
Of course, there were ele the elements of Euclid defining the architecture and hierarchy of mathematical knowledge and truth from definition to proof, but mathematics itself had no language of its own. So Biet's immense epistemologic leap was the concept of the variable, which is the direct result of his cryptoanalytic work. It is what you want to know, the unknown. The introduction of the variable into mathematics as a symbol that could mean, be, mean or be anything marks the emergence of a new way of epistemic practice. At the same time, Descartes thinks that he thinks and the subject is born. But the subject is already, uh, always already a subject of media technologies. This is basically the first printed mathematical formula ever from 1591. But it all actually goes back um, to Iraq in the 8th and 9th century to this uh, guy called uh, Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. And from the word al-Khwarizmi uh, deducted, we have the word algorithm, actually. And he also invented, uh, basically, the, the word algebra also goes back to the title of his book, uh, the Al-Kitab al-Muqtaza fi Hisab al-Jabr, which is algebra, or al um, So Persian mathematics uh, was also very strong very early on. So as you can see in the 15th century and 16th century in numbers, letters, mathematics, everything sort of um, fuses and also it marks the sort of breaking apart of what you can see very up there, it's science and art. Um, they sort of start to separate approximately four or 500 years ago. And uh, we can maybe discuss later if they, if they come back together again one day. Um, in the 17th century, you also have like cryptology is sort of the main concept of knowledge practice, if you will. So um, with the advent of symbolic uh, mathematics and this incredibly powerful mathematical tool that comes into being, nature becomes something that people perceive to be formulated in the language of mathematics and which can be deciphered. and. Uh, and um, be mystified in that way. So I'm going to make a little jump to the 19th uh, and early 20th century where we have a similar situation and there's the idea um, that um, everything can sort of be um, completely formalized and analyzed. And um, also it's the time of World War I and World War II and, um, and the birth of psychoanalysis so um, there's, again, this idea of demystifying and decrypting um, the last secrets that you can uh, express. So a mathematician called David Hilbert invents the system of metamathematics, as he calls it, to sort of proof, the, proof that mathematics is a complete system. And uh, this is basically already the idea of a computer. It's very much to do with um, encrypting and decrypting and sort of finding the prime factors, the most simple components in a system and identifying them. But then um, this guy here, Kurt Gödel, on the, on the right side, uh, the true agent of contingency is a young neo-Leibnizian paranoiac from Vienna. And he follows uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz in this idea of uh, finitude and completeness and computability. So um, what Gödel then ultimately shows, and this is really um, sort of the ep epochal turning point for the history of digital technologies, is that he proves the limits of what uh, is thinkable and proves the limits of um, what is formalizable and then is shortly followed by uh, Alan Turing um, who will turn this whole system into something that can be done with a machine in his uh, seminal text on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem. Um, this proved to be very important for breaking this little machine, which is the German Enigma coding machine. It's an incredibly complex and at that time of World War II technologically unsurpassed electromechanical rotor cipher machine. And Alan Turing basically developed a method of cryptology and invented the computer that uh, he could do these calculations on. 
And with this, um, actually, you could say sort of turned around World War II. This is um, a very cryptic story also, and actually was only declassified in the late 1970s. I think around like in two weeks, maybe there's a movie with Benedict Cumberbatch coming out. So finally, this uh, story, which is also kind of a sad story, um, is entering the general public. So, because um, as not many people know, it was after World War II and after doing humanity a great uh, favor that in 1954, Alan Turing was uh, convicted of uh, gross indecency with another man and given the choice between prison or mandatory hormonal treatment, effectively chemically castrating him. And uh, he was also stripped of all his security clearances and in <coughs> 1954, um, under slightly mysterious circumstances, Turing died from eating a, po a poisoned apple. Um, so, but if we think, yeah, this is uh, the hormones that he was treated with in his pathology report and drawings that he made on the uh, on morphogenesis. Very interesting person, Alan Turing. So, but now we actually finally arrive in the present, and. Um, the thing is that uh, what we have to make clear to us, or the question we always have to ask is who built the infrastructures that we're using? Who's the man in the middle? Who controls the lines that we're using? And um, so I was actually a little bit puzzled about the great public outrage um, resulting from the Snowden revelations, because if you just have a little look at the technological history, that um, created the situation that we're in right now, it has to be clear to everyone that it's always been the big institutions, it's always been the governments, the military and the corporations and cartels that build infrastructures, which is true from early postal systems in the 15th century to the internet. So, um, cryptography and um, the way that we encrypt information on the internet is something that works by creating identity and um, in mathematical ones, this means prime factorization. So every big number can be broken down in a unique set of prime numbers that um, multiplied with each other give us this number. So we uh, uh, turning this process around and finding the prime uh, factors of a very large number, which is what we use for our polyalphabetic substitution, is a very tedious process with large numbers and usually the um, approximately 2040, no, not only approximately, but exactly 2048 um, digits long, the ones that we use today for email, for example. And it's unsolvable in non polynomial time with current computers, which is why encryption today still works, at least until the advent of quantum computers. And then we have to switch to quantum cryptography, which basically works by creating a shared key that cha changes if observed by a third party. So public key cryptography, what we can also um, try out together afterwards in the little workshop, basically works by creating a set of keys. Um, I would rather say creating a key and a lock, and the lock you can publish on the internet, and if someone wants to send you um, an encrypted message, they can use this key or lock um, to encrypt it, and you have your secret key that you keep to yourself and you can unlock it again. It's a very simple, elegant process, and it's basically unbreakable. Um, nowadays, applications, even messages like WhatsApp and Threema start um, to use cryptography, um, which is end-to-end -end and should work, but um, the key problem also is that this software and these um, infrastructures are not open source, they're not transparent. So basically, you still have to trust um, the manufacturers of this software to actually you know, be true to their word. Otherwise, um, I can only recommend using open source software because this is the only way that you can ensure transparency of what the software that you use does. The same is true for Skype, um, but um, the claim that Skype is actually secure and encrypted has been undermined in 2013 by evidence that Microsoft um, has pinged unique URLs embedded in a Skype's conversation, which um, 
is only possible if Microsoft has access to the unencrypted form of these messages. Um, I'm going to go away a little bit now from encryption and talk a little bit more about the way that we use infrastructures anyway and then slowly come to an end. Because um, you can see here already that we have these very nice <coughs> cloudy graphics and this is really um, something that I've, I found out recently that the idea of cloud computing is something that is a direct result of um, computer science's very bad taste in PowerPoint presentations. Um, it, you can look it up actually. This is sort of the, the common historiography of the idea of cloud computing because the cloud actually, um, we can say there is actually no cloud. The cloud is a massive campaign of black boxing information of centralizing it and making it economically and politically usable, as I already mentioned yesterday during the discussion. You could say that the cloud is actually a nebula, it's a fog machine, obscuring the very non-ephemeral, environmentally, ecologically, economically insistent and global, political and geological, biological power structures uh, around us. So this is actually much more transparent than the cloud. I would really recommend to decentralize knowledge, to not store your information in the cloud um, if you don't have to, to not use big services like Dropbox or Google Drive, but to store your information locally, this is the only way that you can ensure a de decentralized and secure way of storing um, information. And it's, I find it quite critical that we, that we live in, that we sort of, yeah, that we get tricked by this metaphorical way of um, by these metaphors. So the only way to actually, yeah, see, we even have the clouds inside the, in the, inside the microprocessors. So think about peer-to-peer -peer and public key exchange. Think about open source and make clear to yourself that this is not about activism, dissent or opposition, but it's about responsibility. Cryptology and um, computer literacy is not a dark art, but it's at the very core of our technological condition and I think something that it's high time that it is addressed more clearly. Um, you all have heard of Bitcoin, which is something that could in the future start to replace the banking system as we know it. But it's also a technology that can be used for other things because in this so-called Bitcoin uh, blockchain, which is the little software that basically stores all of the Bitcoin transactions, you can encode basically everything you want. So recently, an engineer um, proposed creating a blockchain passport, which would be a digital passport that is absolutely unique and unbreakable. Um, you could also use it to identify or authenticize digital art. There are already companies doing this. I think Monograph was started by Rhizome. Yeah. And there's another one called um, Ascribe. So I think post-digital um, means that the internet is ultimately past its teenage years and its coming of age romantics uh, are over and it is slowly becoming what it actually is. Speaking with Immanuel Kant, whom I don't particularly like, it is time to emerge from our self-imposed non-age. We spoke yesterday a little bit about uh, how artificial intelligence is creating empathy, and uh, nowadays it's also learning to play computer games in the labs of DeepMind, a company recently acquired by Google, uh, and it's starting to be able to design magic tricks, uh, which also means that there's a chance that we're looking at a future of David Copperfield like super intelligent douchebag artificial intelligence. There's another chance that artificial intelligence might already be here. Um, as a hushy smoking Baudelaire once wrote, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that it didn't exist. Elon Musk uh, from, of Tesla and Stephen Hawking are already getting very anxious these days. This was um, recently posted by Elon Musk and afterwards deleted maybe two, three weeks ago. So people are getting very, very anxious. Isaac Asimov, the great author, wrote that every sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
In a recent conversation I had with the media archaeologist Yussi Parika, we arrived at the point where we realized that magic actually had to be replaced with nature. So for the discussion I propose that we think about what comes after digital cultures. When do nature and culture, art and science converge again? And which role will we play in it on all the levels discussed, the social, political and intellectual levels? And how do we address questions of agency and literacy? Um, as Edward Snowden said yesterday when accepting the Right Livelihood Award while we were sitting here, the consent of the people is not meaningful if it is not informed. Thank you.